An additional 1.3 million Pfizer vaccines is expected in the, in the country by the end of this month. Meanwhile, health authorities in Ashanti region are alarmed at the speed of public misinformation and myths about the COVID-19 vaccine. Among the mis misconceptions is a video in circulation purporting bodies of persons vaccinated in the ongoing exercise turned electromagnetic. Deputy Health Director in charge of public health, Dr. Michael Roxana J. Fears the myth, if not addressed, could breed vaccine hesitancy among the populace and erode gains made in the fight against COVID-19. On him interior is with our help desk. He has more in the following report. In a viral social media video, a man who claims to be a police officer alleges his mobile phone sticks to his body moments after taking his COVID-19 vaccine. The source of the video is unknown, and the narration does not give information about the type of vaccine he took. The Ashanti Regional Health Director says it is concerned with this type of misinformation and several others in circulation. The Directorate has launched investigations into the claim and several others in public domain. Dr. Michael Roxine J is the Deputy Health Director in charge of public health. We received complaint through the media of um, some persons becoming uh, electromagnetic following um, COVID-19 vaccination. We became very much alarmed, so we set out to investigate the veracity of this. We see it as a major threat now that we are getting a lot of vaccines. But how true is the claim COVID-19 vaccines produce electromagnetic reactions to the human body? We got individuals who have taken the vaccine at a vaccination point and then uh, got them to attach their phone to their upper arm. Some of them, the phone stuck momentarily and then fell off. Others, it didn't. We also made these people wash the sites. Uh, of vaccination um, with water to remove any um, creams or oils that may be on the skin and also cleaned the surface of the phone with alcohol tissue to remove any oil on it. And when they attached it, it didn't. So we, we, we concluded that the, the sebum or that oil on the skin has a sticky property that is wax and oil mixed. So that if you, are, if you have uh, sebum on your skin and you attach any material, any light material like uh, even plastic would attach, a key will attach. Joy News visited some vaccination centers, including the Kumasi Metro Clinic, to test the claim on newly vaccinated people. <laughs> The regional health directory says it will not lodge a complaint with the Ghana Police Service against the said officer for disciplinary action, but it wants the police administration to take interest in persons who spread false information about COVID-19 vaccine. Anti-vaccine people always have um, have um, an aim, so um, we. We don't want to take that action now. The police are where they can take actions without us making any formal complaint. From Kumasi, for Joy News, Ohim Interior reporting. Let's stay in Kumasi because my colleague Ohim Interior joins us uh, via Zoom for more on this one. Um, Ohim Interior, how serious are health authorities taking this and how do they intend to um, deal with this myth? Yes, thank you, Aisha. For the health authorities in the Ashanti region, they see uh, this issue as a serious issue that can affect and erode the gains made as far as the 19 fight in the region is concerned. And so they are doing everything possible within their powers to increase, for instance, the public awareness on the fact that, yes, when you take the COVID 19 vaccines, they don't uh, come with magnetic uh, reactions. They are safe for human use, and they are also safe to protect and save uh, lives as far as COVID 
is concerned. And so it has compelled the health directorate uh, to increase advocacy and awareness on COVID-19 vaccine. Beyond uh, what we see uh, in this report, uh, they've also rolled out a program uh, to go around uh, with information vans, uh, educating the public on COVID-19 uh, vaccine, uh, its safety. And uh, I must say that you say uh, they are increasing this awareness because this is a time that the a country and Ashanti region in that regard will be doing a lot of vaccination exercises. And so if they don't encourage the public, then there's a likelihood that this could lead to a public apathy where the public will also hesitate in going for the COVID-19 vaccines. And so for them, yes, it's a big deal. And it's something that is considered uh, as important that means all the necessary attention it requires. Mm. In, in that video, we heard uh, a few of the vaccinated folks uh, condemning this uh, thing we've seen in the video and also advising uh, the unvaccinated public to go in and take their jabs. But how are they, uh, the unvaccinated public, taking this or how are they responding to this particular one? I must say that the few people that I spoke to, uh, for instance, uh, in the video here, uh, in the report that I filed, are people who themselves allowed themselves to be used in the demonstration by the joint news team and then health uh, directory officials. Uh, they themselves are convinced that there's nothing like magnetic, uh, you know, uh, reactions or magnets in the COVID-19 uh, vaccines. So they themselves admit it, there's nothing like that. And they are the people who have also pledged their commitment and support in sending the information out. So they are more or less uh, become ambassadors. And then going forward, uh, the health authorities will also want to use people who have gone for their COVID-19 vaccines and they are uh, doing well uh, as the uh, gatekeepers to encourage uh, more people to go for the vaccine. For those who are here to go for the vaccine, uh, this message uh, of the via social media videos uh, appear to have taken uh, some sort of a toll on them. Uh, just that when you take your time to explain to them, and uh, after we started this conversation, uh, they, they are getting aware that indeed it is not true that the vaccines uh, have uh, electromagnetic reactions uh, that could affect their uh, bodies. Now they are beginning to understand that, yes, this can never be true, and they are uh, taking the words of the health uh, officials as a true word and then go for the vaccine. But uh, Aisha, let, let me also admit that, yes, the health authorities, in as much as they've started uh, this conversation, they have a very long way. All right, so we lost our him in Syria there. I'm, I'm hoping that he will come back and complete uh, that one. But we are talking about uh, the myth uh, surrounding uh, the vaccine uh, exercise in the Ashanti region. Authorities are worried that people uh, keep on um, circulating fake news, which could uh, bring about vaccine hesitancy. And they say we need to nip this in the bud quickly before it erodes the gains we've made in the COVID-19 fight. Ohemi Teria is back. Ohemi, uh, tell me more. Uh, Aisha, for uh, those who are yet to be vaccinated, uh, earlier the, the idea or the belief was that Yes, if a police officer has done this and is the one, you know, telling the public of what the effect of the vaccine could be, then they believed and then took his words uh, seem to be true. But with the kind of uh, education that the health authorities have stepped up, indication is that it will go a long way to ameliorate uh, people's uh, fear as far as the vaccine is concerned. And as I stated earlier, the health authorities believe that and now that more vaccines are coming out, and now that more people are being vaccinated, if they allow this information, negative information to fester among the minds of the people, then it will go a long way to affect vaccination exercise. Not only the current one, but the future ones. Uh, people will emerge 
it will sort of create vaccine hesitancy among the larger population. If you look at the number of people that have been vaccinated in the Ashanti region and compared to the number, uh, the population of the region, it means we are nowhere near even uh, a fraction of it. And so if they allow this negative message to be circulated, then it will go a long way to affect uh, the crusade against COVID-19 and the vaccination exercise itself. Uh, I thought that this was something that is not all that serious. Uh, but when I spoke to some few people, and uh, if they have had the opportunity to uh, they have come across with these videos, the information that I got was that, yes, most of them uh, had them on their phones. They showed me just that they were not prepared uh, to share this information publicly with us. But I must say that, yes, uh, this uh, negative or the misinformation is already in the public domain. But our human aside uh, discounting uh, this uh, myth and also educating the public, uh, do authorities have plans of collaborating with the police to actually arrest some of the people who churn out these videos, these fake videos, and circulate them? At least the one we saw, there was a face to it. Yes, uh, exactly the point, uh, the, exactly the question I asked the deputy health director in charge of public health. Uh, Dr. Roxanne Michael J., uh, who says uh, for now the health directorate is not considering any uh, legal action or uh, arrest or prosecution of, of persons behind uh, this uh, fake and false information uh, being circulated in the public domain. Uh, what he did say is that uh, the videos are out. If police who are to enforce the safety uh, of the people, laws on the safety of the people uh, in the system, they are already have a couple of those uh, videos. So they expect uh, police themselves to effect arrest. But when I pointed to him that uh, police can only uh, take action when there's complaint or report a uh, lodge uh, at their uh, doorsteps, he says, yes, uh, maybe the health authorities will consider uh, taking uh, action on this one. But for now, they are also concentrating on the public education to sensitize the general public to be aware of the difference between the right information and then the uh, first one uh, being churned out in the public. Uh, so, uh, so for uh, the officials here, uh, what they are trying to do is to encourage uh, more people uh, to be aware of this uh, situation and then be guided uh, by the fact that people are circulating uh, false information and stay away from this false and dangerous information that could be detrimental to their health. As far as they are concerned, uh, COVID-19 vaccines uh, have come to stay, and it's one of the right ways uh, to safeguard lives. Uh, they say that if you look at the number of people who have been vaccinated in the region and compared to the fatalities that have been reported in the region, the indication is that all the people uh, who got vaccinated are none of them have fallen victims or have died of COVID-19 and its complications. So they are very hopeful that going forward, once they increase the advocacy, once they increase the public education, it can, you know, diffuse whatever negative message that anybody at all wants to put out in the public domain. Oyamenteria is our colleague in the Ashanti region. He's been monitoring the vaccination exercise Fort Ross. Now, the North East Regional Minister, Yindana Zakari, has called for the establishment of buffer zones in communities along the White Volta River in the region as an interim measure to mitigate the impact of the annual disaster caused by the spillage from the Bagri Dam and seasonal rains. The minister explains the buffer zones will serve as a neutral area in the communities where farmers and residents alike will not be allowed to farm or build residential houses. Mr. Zakari said it was time to institute concerted commitment and efforts to sustain the fight against disaster in the region. He was speaking at the inauguration of the Regional Disaster Management Committee in Nalerigu, where correspondent Elias Tanko filed this report from. The National Disaster Management Organization Act 927 establishes disaster management committees at the national, regional, and district levels, chaired by the Minister for the Interior, regional ministers, and district chief executives, respectfully. In view of this, 
the Northeast Regional Coordinating Council with the National Disaster Management Organization and with support from partners sworn into office a 15-member regional disaster management committee to regulate and coordinate disaster prevention and responses in the region. The committee is made up of a regional minister as the chairperson, the regional NADMO director as the secretary, regional heads of several department and partners, and DCEs of the affected areas. The regional minister, Yidana Zakari, speaking at the event, provided an update of the tragedy so far recorded in part of the region as a result of continued heavy downpours. This year, residents of the Northeast region have had a bitter experience. Even before they opened the Bagri Dam, their experiences were just one too many. We lost lives, we lost property, we lost our farms, and even lost wild life. As at the last count, we lost in total 12 lives. Eight, two drowning, one, no, three by tender strike, and another one, unfortunately, was an incident involving man and the elephants. Perennial flooding caused by heavy rains and the opening of the Bagre Dam in the last decade have killed over 200 people and millions of properties destroyed in northern Ghana. 11 people have died already this year, even as the Bagre is yet to be spilled. To end the annual disaster, the government of Ghana cut a sword for the construction of the Pualugu multi-purpose dam project. But with the project still far from commencing, the regional minister is proposing an interim solution. And for me, one suggestion I want to make is this. Every year, they are opening Bagri Dam, Nadmo, and back on sensitization. This has gone on since Bagri Dam was actually uh, created. This year, the same sensitization is ongoing. The people will move to higher grounds. When the water level recedes, they are back to the same area. Meaning, the following year, you have another challenge. Is it not possible that when we engage with the chiefs, political authorities, religious and political leaders, we create a buffer around these areas so that when they move out, they have no basis to go back there and have their settlements established. Until we do that, we are not going to go anywhere. In any case, if you are asked to move to higher grounds, it is because there's danger. Why do you run back there again? And then the following year, it is these same people who will cry of neglect. Let's get an update on the flooding situation in Northeast because we know 11 lives have already been lost so far following days of the flooding in that area. Eliaso Tanko, a correspondent in that area, joins me via Zoom. Eliaso, first tell us what the situation looks like currently with regards to the floods in that area. Well, the situation remains the same, uh, even though this, uh, today there have not been enough rains in the region. But uh, uh, most of the most part of some part of the region, especially the Mampurgu Muadur area, still uh, have their uh, uh, communities flooded. The farmlands are also flooded as we speak right now. Uh, but the situation remains the same. It's not different from uh, what has happened since the beginning of this week. That, that uh, Nadmo couldn't reach out to some affected communities before because they were cut off. What has become of uh, reliefs to families trapped in these areas? Well, the Nadmo says that uh, they have put measures in place uh, to ensure that uh, they are able to extend public services uh, to that particular area. Yesterday, the Nadmo, the, the organization, service in Wale Wale here uh, to uh, have conversation with them 
on how to extend medical service to those areas that have been cut off. Uh, the DC also have been speaking to us, uh, also asking for assistance uh, because apparently some of the rules to those communities have also been destroyed as well. Uh, and so NADMO, as we speak, uh, we understand some of them have been able to reach some of this, these communities and the situation is not that serious in those communities, but there are others that they are yet to reach. And so uh, they have not been able to reach those people and they are praying that the water level will subside or uh, the rain will stop coming so that they will be able to uh, reach these people and provide some assistance to them. Elias Atanko is a man in the Northeast region. We're still monitoring this. We'll bring you more updates in our subsequent bulletins. We'll take a break on the pulse. Uh, when we return, we'll be talking about education. We have a conversation also about a library project uh, which uh, one single man is trying to put up for Ghana. He's gathered over 30,000 books. We'll have that conversation. Remember to tweet at us at the post my personal handle is at the nana aisha to stay with me
Welcome back to The Pulse. Remember to join the conversation and tweet at us at the hashtag The Pulse. Now, the Complementary Education Agency of the Ministry of Education, formerly the Non-Formal Education Division, is to roll out a new campaign aimed at eliminating illiteracy in the country ahead of the 2030 deadline set under the Sustainable Development Goal. As part of the measures, officials will head out into the communities to look for persons who have either dropped out of school or have not obtained education at all and offer them free education. Sounds interesting already. In the studio to discuss this is Priscilla Awimbe Kusa. She's head of communications at the complementary education agency Accra Metro and would also be joined shortly by Samuel Pencil Edubwa for district coordinator Accra Metro office. Um, I'm grateful that you were able to make it to the studio. Let's start with what has occasioned this. Okay, good afternoon to your viewers. Um, the ministry realized that when it comes to education, the informal sector is lacking out. So they decide, decided to add an extra tax to the non-formal education, now the complementary education agency, for us to take the mandate of making sure that the non-literate youth or children of school-going age between the ages of six to SHS level will get education through the complementary basic education. Mm. You, you intend to uh, go out all out, look for people who do not have, who, have part, who are partly educated or not educated at all and give them the free education. But how do you intend to achieve this? Are you going to be roaming on the streets and calling people? How do you intend to go about this? Okay, our division has something we call the community entry system, where we enter the communities and talk to the opinion leaders. So we'll do it together with the opinion leaders, the assembly members, the chiefs, and all the people who matter mm. in the community for them to help us identify these people to be able to roll them in our program. Mm. And so have you started... Um, have you started consultations with these opinion leaders and chiefs already? What has been their response to this program? Okay, yes, we have. And the response has been very positive. Mm. We've started identifying those who have not been to school at all and are of school going age and those who have been dropped out mm. from the formal school. Okay, so let's look at when you intend to do this and then let's also look at where and how you're going to uh, be, uh, I mean, dividing the program. Uh, for instance, are you going to do region by region, um, constituency by constituency, district by district? I mean, how are you going to demarcate the, uh, the, 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 the exercise? Okay. We are going to do it all over the country. Non-formal education, now the complementary education agency is everywhere in the country. So every district, district has been tasked to make sure that they enter into the community and engage the leaders to be able to identify them. Mm. Go ahead. To be able to identify them and get them educated so that in future, those who are supposed to join the mainstream school will be taken back to GES for them to take care of their needs. Mm. And those who are supposed to fall under what we now call the JHS remedials okay. will also be taken through for them to join their colleagues to write the basic education certificate yeah, examination. Let's look at your target areas. Um, okay. I'm looking at age brackets first. I'm looking at um, at what level you want to target. What, what are your target areas? Okay. We are looking at um, kindergarten to SHS. Okay. Yes. And the cutting to yes, yes, yes. When are you starting this? Next month, that's October. And it's a nine month cycle for every level. We have three levels that's level one, level two, level three. Mm. So when we take them through for the nine months pro process, after 
we assess them to see the level in which they fit into and we push them to GS. So we are liaising with GS. We are not going to do it alone. Mm. And it is their curriculum we are using. Okay. What, what, why are you going to start from? You must have priority areas. Because if you're talking about education, you know that certainly some regions um, are far ahead than others. So yes. which are your priority areas? Okay. The rural areas. And even in Accra, we have some areas that people are lacking behind. So I am for the AMA district, and we've started, so it's all over. All right, Priscilla Awimbe. Um, so once you do this nine months target, um, what do you intend to achieve at the end of the day? What's the objective, the goal, at the end of the nine months? Okay. The goal is to equip them to be able to fit into any level they are supposed to be in. As I said earlier on, we have three levels. So when we, we, we go into the community, we assess the learners we get and get to know where they fall short, whether they, they, they are SHS dropout, JHS dropout, then we know where to place them and take them through the program. Mm. So, so initially you told me that you've had engagement with stake, um, uh, opinion leaders, yes. chiefs who are interested in this, but have you also had the opportunity to engage some of the learners you're talking about? Yes, so far we, we've had the opportunity to engage some of the learners. And you've identified those who need help? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. How many so far? Okay, I don't have the figure now, okay. but we've been able to identify them. Okay. And we are still on it. Mm. So you intend to start with how many, or you are just going all out, I mean, across the country, you, you should have a plan. Yes. Um, we are going all out across the country. So next month when you start, what date exactly? Okay, the date, just from the 1st of October. 1st of October, when you start, we should see your representatives in all 16 regions? Yes. That's what's going to happen? Yes, that's what is going to happen. All right. We wish you all the best. I'll see you. And back on this one, Priscilla Wimbe Kusa, she's head of communications, complementary um, education agency, Accra Metro, who's been having this wonderful conversation with us. Let's still talk about education because the University of Cape Coast has been ranked best university globally for their research influence. It has also been ranked the number one university in Ghana, the top university in West Africa, and part of the top five universities in Africa. Oh my God, why didn't I attend University of Cape Coast? The announcement was contained in the 2022 Times Higher Education Annual Rankings. Universities that published high impact research on COVID-19 have sought up the league table with China reaping the most rewards. The 2022 World University Rankings include more than 1,600 universities across 99 countries and territories, making them the largest and most diverse university rankings to date. Richard Kwejonyako has been interacting with the Director of Research, Innovation and Consultancy at the University of Cape Coast, Professor Frederick Atoama, asking him pertinent questions about the feet chalked by the university should be an exciting period for you at the directorate and the University of Cape It is quite exciting for us because we have come a long way. Uh, such an achievement is not something that you do overnight. It takes careful planning. It, 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 it involves uh, scanning the horizon to look at the issues that are topical for you to engage. It calls for deep uh, thinking to see what your strategy is. So we've come a long way and we are very, very happy. Of course, during the past 60 years, UCC has carved a niche for itself as a university of academic excellence. Yes, so our track record is there, but we needed to cement this by coming on board the ranking for the globe to know that UCC has arrived. But what went into this particular ranking? And is UCC a new entrant? Yes, UCC is a debutant. This is the first time the University of Cape Coast is being ranked. In the past, we attempted, but we couldn't get ranked because the entry or eligibility criteria is very stringent. There are seven concurrent eligibility criteria or inclusion exclusion criteria every university must meet before you are ranked. 
we were able to meet the six, but the very first criterion we struggled to meet. That means that the first criteria actually talks about publishing thousand papers, more than thousand papers within a five year span. And within each of the five years, the threshold publications you should have is 150. And here the operational phrases, uh, relevant publications. And when we say relevant publications, we are talking about papers that are indexed in Elsevier's database called Scopus. So that is what kept us from being ranked. So behind the scenes, we were doing self-introspection to ascertain why we have not been able to get that number of papers to be ranked. And we came out with a number of challenges and we started looking at addressing those challenges in a systematic manner. So we asked colleagues to redirect their papers to the Scopus Index Journals. We asked colleagues to forge partnerships that are impactful. We asked colleagues to also attend conferences, go for workshops and things like that, that will expose them to the research uh, community. And we were organizing uh, training workshops to help colleagues to do research which is globally and regionally significant. So we took steps behind the scenes to ensure that our general management policy that we uh, implemented was explicit, saying that colleagues should desist from publishing in outlets that are not credible. And we took every step to ensure that this was done. What got you ranked um, for research impact? As you are aware, UCC is ranked number one in Ghana. It is ranked number four in Africa. And it is also ranked number one in West Africa. And it has never happened that a debutant would do this. To dislodge the national leader, to dislodge the, uh, the uh, sub-regional leader, and even to place fourth, it's unprecedented. And, and something which is momentous. And I believe that uh, it takes painstaking effort to get to that particular uh, spot. You can't do this overnight. It, you have to take some steps to get there, and this is what we did. Now, I will say that what we have done is also unique when it comes to the uh, citation impact. That gauges research influence, research influence. You see, you, you can publish the research. You can look at the constellation of research partnerships. But you also want to know who is using your research and for what purpose? Because when you, you, you do research, the goal is to generate knowledge. The reason why we do research is to generate knowledge. That knowledge must translate into some useful product which is innovative for society. So societal impact is pivotal when it comes to this. And industrial application of the innovations is also very, very important. So what this means is that when we talk about globally, UCC is ranked number one for research influence. As I said, we by this particular metric, we did better than universities like Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, because we scored perfect on that. We had a perfect score, whereas they had 95, 94, 97, and things like that. So we are ranked number one when it comes to research impact. Now, the research process itself is different from the research impact. You can do the research, but if you don't uh, tease out the knowledge that's been uh, produced or elicited from that research for industrial application, then the influence is not going to be known. So how many people are using our research? How many people are applying the knowledge that UCC has generated? This is what we were ranked as number one globally. And it is instructive to know that it's unprecedented in the context of the uh, uh, Ghanaian ecosystem. Wait, so you mean that the University of Oxford University, Cambridge and all of that UCC sits on their top now? Yes, for that metric. You know, there are five or so domains. We have research excellence, teaching excellence, research influence, uh, international outlook, industry income. These are the five domains, and there are 13 metrics or indicators that are used across these five domains. And I'm saying that in one of the domains, which is research impact or research influence, also known as the Field Weighted Citation Index, we did better than these universities that are the forefront when it comes to the ranking in general. So you have the overall rank where they do better because we didn't do well in other of, uh, uh, domains. But they did better in other, that's why they are ranked higher. But when it comes to research influence, we are not ranked number one. We did better than they did. So what does it mean for this country, for the University of Cape Coast, for Ghana, and even the entire um, sub, uh, sub region? So first of all, we have to ask ourselves, which research constellations yielded this research influence? So we have to do a, 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 some data analysis to know which are the notes that are accruing to our benefit in terms of research influence and hit those notes and then look at the gaps that are also there and try to really re-engineer the system so that we'll have partnerships that are much more fulfilling or much more impactful for us because i mean uh, 
if you are ranked number one, it means that you are not going to be ranked number one forever. There are other universities that are also interested in supplanting you at that particular spot. So it means that you have to also expand what you are doing to make sure that you are responsive to 21st century uh, research challenges and needs. But we as a university must take uh, the time to sit down, to look at the notes. I will believe that uh, the kind of partnerships that we have forged, in fact, we did some studies where we partnered with uh, many scholars, uh, for instance, the Global Burden of Disease Studies. These are studies that are very research, uh, uh, very strong research uh, focus, and then the impact is very huge. You see, we have a few of our colleagues who are working in that particular domain, and that has accrued to our benefit. I believe that's the collateral benefit that we have derived from, from that particular uh, engagement. So it's very, very important that uh, we look at it from that particular context. The global burden of disease. Then we also uh, have to sit down and to know which disciplines give us these uh, high rankings, or which disciplines contributed immensely. Of course, it is a collective effort, but the, the level of contribution to the effort will not be homogeneous across board. It will not be homogeneous across board. Some disciplines will fare better in terms of their contribution to our research impact. We need to identify and isolate those uh, domains and see how we can even help them to do better. And then we look at areas, academic disciplines that we have not fared so well.